to the last um, discussion on this season and the wise meetings. Our And if you would like to talk in the next season, please email one of the conveners. We have two awesome talks that I'm looking forward to today. Our first will be from Debbie Ailtank from EPFL. Debbie, if you could share your screen and take it away. All right. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me. It's really nice to uh, be able to give a talk here. So yeah, the topic of today was wave breaking. So I'll discuss two projects. Uh, one is a, a project on the wave envelope evolution with breaking, and the other is on particle transport. Um, yeah, so I'll be using some machine learning techniques. So I thought it would be fun to 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 have as a an opening picture picture of a wave but generated by some AI um, uh, text to image uh, thing. So this was my, my uh, assignment was an impressionist painting of a dramatic close-up of the crest of a breaking wave with yellow ping pong balls floating on the water. So I think it turned out pretty well after, after a few failed tries. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Um, first, I'll, I'll discuss uh, a deterministic way or the uh, evolution of water waves. So um, this nonlinear uh, envelope evolution where we use this machine learning hybrid to, to uh, incorporate the wave breaking. And then um, I'll talk about this stochastic uh, model to um, predict particle trajectories. And hopefully I can convey a bit the importance of uncertainty quantification in this predictive uh, setting. And if there's time, I'll talk about some future uh, projects, but let's let's dive right in. So this started uh, at the end of my PhD, uh, still at the University of Geneva, where I did the wave tank experiments at the uh, Ex Marseille University in the wave tank there. <clears throat> and then for my uh, joint postdoc with uh, Oxford and MIT, so Tom van der Bremer and Temis Sapses, where I worked out more of the, the model and the theory. And Amin Chapshup and his um, PhD student uh, Yushan actually did some extra experiments on the other side of the world at the University of Sydney. Um, so the workhorse to, to describe the envelope evolution is the 1D cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So the envelope A propagates forward in space, undergoes dispersion in time and nonlinear um, modulation. Um, to make this more correct and actually be able to compare to wave tank experiments, we'd like to also include the higher order terms. This was done by Dista. And in our case, we also add these viscous damping terms uh, introduced by Carter and Govan, mostly to actually uh, stabilize the MNLS solver. So yeah, all of what I'm showing you is in, in 1D, so long crested waves and just to quickly uh, flash, this is quite unusual for a dynamical system to propagate in space rather than time, but this is more convenient to compare to the wave tank where we have, let's say, a time series as an initial condition. We correct for the linear group velocity, and then um, this initial condition propagates as a function of distance. You take the Fourier transform, you have the spectrum. So in my understanding, um, if there are no external effects such as uh, wind or current, there are two ways uh, for wave breaking to occur. The first is nonlinear focusing. So if you would have a, a plane wave perturbed by two sidebands, if this evolves, you have the nonlinear interactions that leads to the modulation of the envelope. And if this gets uh, too steep, a uh, wave can break. And when this happens, this downshift to the lower sideband doesn't recur back to the initial condition, but it becomes permanent. The second way is if you have a continuous spectrum, so it could be Gaussian, John swap, uh, but you tune the phases such that they all have a maximum at a certain distance um, by um, positive interference, uh, this will create a very steep wave at this uh, distance. And if it's steep enough, it will also break. Now here too, if we look at the evolution of the spectrum, uh, we see that this uh, higher frequency part is killed when there is wave breaking. So there's also an effective downshift in the spectrum. Of course, more um, uh, 
like the real ocean would be to have a, a John swap spectrum, let's say, but with random phases. And here, as far as I can tell, there is not really a clear signature in the spectrum of wave breaking. But of course, you can see that the in the time domain, the steepness never goes above a certain physical limit. So, and then of course, in this irregular uh, C, let's say, uh, both these two other mechanisms play a role. To what ratio, I, I, I don't really know. But the goal of our study is not to be able to detect wave breaking, it's to be able to simulate the evolution of the waves uh, with or without breaking. So if there is no breaking, the MNLS really does a really great job. If there's breaking um, with this dissipation, it continues, but it's wrong. So there have been uh, previous uh, models to, to be able to incorporate uh, wave breaking for this uh, for the MNLS or the NLS. Um, there will be a paper coming out soon by Yushan Liu, a PhD student at the, the group in Oxford of um, Thomas Adcock and previously Tom also, uh, where he compares these breaking models that are usually developed for this three wave system and that they don't really extend to these dispersive focused waves. So of course, the other option is to do uh, Navier-Stokes simulations or variations thereon, and these work really nicely, but they're super heavy computationally. Um, so it's not an option for the setting uh, we want to use it in. So instead, what can we compare it to? Well, it's experiments. And uh, this is what we did. So the idea was to have this very simple physical model, the MNLS, um, to supplement this with some machine learning layer and then this should give the true evolution, including wave breaking. In our case, this true evolution is given by the uh, experiment. This is how we can train this machine learning layer. So usually with machine learning, you need a lot of data. So we did many, many experiments for all these three wave categories. And just to explain like how it should work once the model is trained, just to have an idea of where we're going with this, is that, like with a normal MLS, you, you have some initial condition at some initial position that you know, then you want to calculate the propagation. So we split this up for the real space and the, the frequency domain. This will be wrong if there is wave breaking. So for whatever propagation distance you chose, can be short, can be long, you, you put that into this uh, recurrent neural network. So, sorry, this would have a memory effect. And this will correct it to give the right evolution. Okay, so how, how do we train this recurrent neural network? Well, as I said, we did many experiments, but we also augmented our data by uh, uh, circulating the time vector, by starting from different wave gauges, cutting it up into different uh, lengths. But in the end, the, the procedure is always the same. We create input and output pairs. So the input would be the MNLS simulation for a certain number of steps, which we always vary. And if you would feed this into an untrained neural network, the output would be random. Um, but we know what the output should be given by the measurements. So we wanna minimize the error between the prediction of the untrained network and the true output. And this we call the cost function. By showing it many examples, um, we can reduce this function by something that's called the gradient descent. So we tune, we vary the parameters a little bit with every example, and then we get to a minimum where the prediction is very close to the true output. Um, so once the model has been trained, we can then show it uh, examples of evolutions that it's never seen before to test if it if it actually learned what we wanted it to learn. So here's an example for this first wave category, the modulated plane wave. The top row is the time domain, the bottom row is the spectrum. And we see this for this initial condition, the MNLS predicts this recurrence cycle, whereas the measurement shows that there's a downshift. So probably there was wave breaking. And this, our model, supplemented with the machine learning correction indeed uh, shows this. 
So in a way, this machine learning layer, because it has memory of previous steps, it's able to fill in uh, this, this smaller scale, this turbulent scale for this dynamical systems. It's able to decouple the potential flow from the turbulent effect. Um, what I just pointed out. And uh, for the focused waves, it's the same thing. Um, sorry, I lost my mouse. Um, for the MNLS, we see that there's a lot of uh, amp or high amplitude in the spectrum here, whereas in the measurement, it's absent. And this is again, correctly reproduced by our, our model. For the, the third category, the random irregular waves, uh, we only look at the time domain because as I said, in the frequency domain, there, there was not a clear signature. And here we see that if you have some initial condition that's propagated by the MNLS, you get these unphysical high um, peaks of amplitude. And these are corrected by the machine learning layer. And not only that, also the subsequent evolution uh, is, is corrected. So yeah, and here again, thanks to Amin and Yushan for, for uh, doing these supplementary uh, experiments. Um, so in summary, uh, we, we created this, what we call finite domain corrections to the MNLS because we take a finite number of steps before correcting. And in this way, this turbulent process can be captured because of the memory uh, that, that you can incorporate in this neural network and it can be decoupled from the potential flow. So future directions would be, of course, always to extend to directional C, not so simple, but also to have an infinitesimal uh, correction. So with every uh, step of the solver. And for this, you need correct uh, phase information, which we did not have for these experiments. So then uh, on to the next uh, topic, uh, particle trajectories. So. Before it was a, a deterministic system and now we go to stochastic dynamics. Again, an artist impression. So this project I did with uh, Tons Group um, with the TU Delft and University of Oxford with Ross Calvert and students Jesse and John uh, who did the experiment mostly and I just harvested their, their, their data. Um, so when I visited Ton a few years ago, he was doing experiments with the ocean cleanup uh, project. And there they, they, they were talking about how, so their goal is to, to find patches of garbage on the ocean basically and, and clean them up. But they said that often it's very hard to predict uh, where this, this patch of plastic will be at a later time. So they have to send their vessel there and, and this gives uh, them a lot of trouble to find the right location. And here's another example of the large, much larger scale, the study by Dobler et al, where in the top row they use, uh, I don't know exactly what type of pollution this is, but they use a prediction model that does not include the Stokes drift and at the bottom, it does include the Stokes drift. So you see it gives very different results. So one can imagine that also variations on the Stokes drift uh, can really affect predictions. So um, we thought wave breaking will probably give variations on the Stokes drift. And so at this more smaller scale, because I'm sure other effects play uh, a part when you go to very large scales, but on smaller scales, rescue operations, oil spills, these could all benefit from a good uh, prediction. So just to clarify a bit the problem set up, uh, we thought if you are given um, a significant wave height and a peak frequency, or maybe even a spectral measurement, and you know uh, the particles of interest are at a certain location, you want to predict their evolution. And again, we exclude all the difficult effects like wind and currents. Um, because you don't know the phases, this, this spectrum can have many uh, different uh, surface elevation realizations, um, all with different random phases. So if you put your particles, the initial position here, they could all have a very different um, evolution. So in the end, the right question to ask is more um, rather than trying to 
which is what we originally thought deterministically somehow gives some prediction. In this specific problem setup, it makes more sense to, to, to move to a stochastic prediction. So if this is a 2D surface, you start out with some probability uh, distribution of your particles and you wanna know like, how does this drift and diffuse? How does the uncertainty increase as we move forward in time? So this was this reference to this uh, Anderson quote of more is different that sometimes you cannot uh, reduce from one description scale to the other and you have to just resort to a different um, description altogether. So we chose to, to, to use the framework of stochastic dynamics. Just a quick overview in case you're not familiar with the, the notation. Um, here on the top is an ODE, so it's simply a, an ordinary differential equation. The XTT is equal to some function mu of X, and now we add some noise E to T. Then to write this as a stochastic differential equation, uh, it's usually written in, in this form. So dx here, x is say the particle position. The deterministic part is here with dt, but there's also this noise process, in this case, a Wiener process. All right. Mm. And because of this random noise, you can generate many different trajectories. So here in gray, and the blue line would be the mean of these trajectories. You can imagine that at one time slice, um, you can make a histogram, and if you have enough samples, this histogram will um, uh, go towards a probability density function p of x. So for every stochastic differential equation, you can, in principle, if you can find it, write down a corresponding Fokker-Planck equation, which is now a PDE for the probability density function p of x with a drift term and a diffusion term. So this is this icon. And first I thought, okay, this uncertainty quantification is a bit boring. It's just about giving error bars. But really for, this is true for linear systems, but for nonlinear systems, it is very important, of course. For instance, for a predator-prey system, either you can have a, a balance between the predators and prey a limit cycle, or one of the species can go extinct. Um, the same for weather forecasts and perhaps also um, particle drift. So we um, write down the variation in the position as a function of uh, drift and diffusion, where the drift is the mean Stokes drift. So here's this famous Wikipedia picture of the Stokes drift. So if I plot then the position X as a function of time, this would have a constant slope and some oscillations around. But for uh, spectrums such as the uh, John Swap spectrum, uh, you would have a different kick, let's say, for each wave with a different amplitude, different frequency, different steepness. So you'd have a mean Stokes drift given by the, the spectrum and some variance around that. Then, including the wave breaking, there's this nice body of work by Nick Pizzo, uh, Luc Dijke, Luc Lenin, Melville about how uh, particles can surf on breaking waves. So they have a much higher forward velocity when they're caught by the crest of a breaking wave. Um, so in this figure here, this is the trajectory of a particle that does not uh, meet the breaking wave. And here you see this huge forward velocity. Uh, so these are DNS uh, simulations. And here on the right is a figure of the experimental uh, work done by uh, Luc Lenin and colleagues, um, where you see that this distance traveled with one wave group passing as a function of what the position was with respect to the breaking crest. Um, it's very uh, spread. <laughs> so this was another um, motivation for us to, to go down this stochastic path. So what we need for our, our jump process, let's say, is um, the number of jumps per time unit, but also a distribution for the amplitudes of the jumps. Because as you can see here in this figure, these are not always uh, the same, of course. Um, 
to complete this stochastic framework, we, we also write down the corresponding Fokker-Planck equation. And later on, this will allow us to calculate more easily the, the analytic expression for the, for the moments of the distribution. So, um, of course, it's nice to compare two experiments. So this is a picture of Ton in a wave tank. Um, and yeah, like I said, they, um, they sorry, I'll, I'll remove you now, Ton. They, um, they did the experiments in, in, in Delft on Ross, Yes, and Jung. And um, the setup was as follows. There's a camera hanging above the wave tank. Part, many, many particles are launched a bit after the wave maker and they are tracked by the, by the camera. And so we did this experiment for different uh, steepnesses, wave heights. So for the lowest wave height, there was almost no breaking events, so no surfing events either, or jumping events in, in our uh, model. <clears throat> and for the highest wave steepness, there were, there were many jumps. So this is an example of of a few of such uh, trajectories. Here's a zoom in. So this is a position as a function of time. So we see these oscillations that are the different um, waves in the, in, in the groups passing by. And now if we look at the higher steepness, we sometimes see these huge, um, yeah, jumps in position. So, um, Let's see where I'm at. To describe this, um, we need to fill in the parameters of this uh, stochastic differential equation. And so our goal was basically to see, okay, we think this SDE can describe what we see. Does it match an experiment with reasonable parameters? So in this sense, it's not a predictive setting, but it's more, is it descriptive? Um, so as I said, we need this <clears throat> jump frequency and this jump amplitude distribution. So this jump frequency capital lambda and this jump amplitude S uh, distribution P of S. So when we have the, from the trajectories, the instantaneous velocity, we set some threshold above which and we say, okay, this is a very high velocity. This must be a jump. And then we can calculate, okay, what is the distance of this jump? So this will give this amplitude uh, distribution and also the number of jumps per time unit. Then, uh, because we, we did this for, for different wave steepnesses or different significant wave heights, um, we can uh, fit this. So here we thought, okay, there must be some plateau. So let's use a, um, a sigmoid function. And for the jump amplitude, we presumed a gamma distribution because it goes to zero at zero, as opposed to a Gaussian distribution, for instance. And the gamma distribution is two parameters, alpha and beta. So we also fit these as a function of steepness. And now we have um, the ingredients we need to, to uh, make simulations with this model. So if we do, <clears throat> we see that when we don't include this jump process, um, or when we do include the jump process, the, um, the mean displacement is increased. So it's the first moment. The second moment is the variance is also increased. And the skewness, the third moment, it goes from uh, zero to a finite value. So this means that there is a deviation from a Gaussian distribution, which only has uh, two moments. So this means that there is a nonlinear process going on. And now if we compare this to the experiment, um, we see that the measured uh, mean, so these are these thick lines here at the top, uh, indeed uh, mean displacement follows this uh, linear scaling in time that we predict, and the value is, is quite similar here on the left, you see, but it's also quite similar to what you would predict just by looking at the, the Stokes drift, the mean Stokes drift, the dashed um, black line. Whereas if you look at a high steepness case for braking, the prediction of the Stokes drift really underestimates the mean displacement. And we also see that this thin line here at the bottom, it's the third uh, moment. So this is the, the skewness. Uh, it's finite, where for non-braking waves, it's, it's almost non-existent. So we think the experiment can be quite well described by our model. Um, 
and we show that these jumps leads to an increased mean and variance of the displacements and deviates from this Gaussian distribution. And yeah, basically this was a, um, a setup to, to be expanded on in, in the future. So it can be extended to directional C states. And it would be nice to also have a predictive value. And to do this, I mean, now, as you saw before, I, I fitted a function on four points, which is the four experiments we did. You could either do many more experiments or you could go another route by linking to the, the breaking statistic. Uh, so it's the, the, let's say the area of a breaking crest um, over a unit area per unit time for which exist heuristic formulas. Um, and then you would have a more predictive uh, model. And what you could then also do is make the parameters in the model stochastic themselves. So in this way, whatever prediction you give, at least you're honest about all the uncertainties that, that go into it. Um, I don't know how I am on time. Maybe. So we have four minutes with questions. So maybe if you okay. can take one minute and I, I do want to hear a little bit about what you're working on in the future. Yeah, so I'll just, to for, for for, yeah, I'll just flash it. So right now what I'm working on is um, basically a Fokker-Planck simulation, but in high dimensions. So for a quantum phase space, and instead of evolving this high dimensional PDE, we just evolve the parameter space. So we use, let's say, machine learning ansatz machine learning model without external data to reduce the dimension of the problem. And the other thing was um, to see machine learning itself or a deep neural network as nonlinear dynamics. So a nonlinear system, you go from x at t plus one as a function of x at t or x t minus one. And the same way you could see that you could step through the layers of a neural network. And once you make this change of frame of of, of thinking, then you can use all kinds of techniques from nonlinear systems, such as stability analysis to stabilize and, and actually give some fundamental reasons why you choose a certain neural network instead of just randomly picking what works. That That's it in a nutshell. Um, yeah, thanks so much for listening. Let, let's thank our speaker here. It's a wonderful talk. So I see that Lev has already thrown on his video. I assume he wants to ask a question. Lev, I, I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else. No, I cannot hear. Right. Lev is not gonna ask a question. Do we have any other questions from the audience here? I have a question then. Was there any feedback between the machine learning algorithm and the potential flow? So you're kind of like uh, dissipating the potential flow, but is there any impact of what the machine learning algorithm that's modeling the breaking is doing back on the potential flow? No, it's it's one way, let's say. So yeah, the, the network gets input from the flow, but it doesn't give back. But if so uh, you, Sean, uh, the student at Oxford is, is working on this uh, infinitesimal step project, and I think he's making good progress. And then this would be the case. Then you would uh, feed information back and forth between the two. And nice. yeah, then you could probably also more easily generalize to other wave types. Yeah. That, that sounds really fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're up at the uh, half hour mark here. If we have other questions for Debbie, we can drop them in the chat or you can send her an email. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for having me. And Morteza Durakti, who is the next speaker, if you could load your screen here when you get a sec. I'm trying to stop. All right, we are seeing this Morteza. Morteza Durakti is coming from the University of Washington. Oh, we do see presenter view. Ah, how about that? Better. Thank so Morteza, the stage is yours. All right, uh, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk about the uh, scaling and parameterization of weight breaking dissipation. And the main goal here is to provide a unified uh, formulation from deep to shallow water. So the main goal here is uh, estimate the post-breaking behavior, the dissipation of energy mainly, uh, using the information we have at breaking inception. Uh, which uh, ideally you, you, you can obtain this information uh, accurately with uh, nonlinear wave models. Okay, um, so motivation, if you have a good uh, estimate of this dissipation, you can estimate the rates of wave energy loss and you can predict the wave height decay. Also, it's important if you have a good estimation of uh, this dissipation rate, you can have a good representation of wave forcing and also good prediction for breaking induced turbulence and mixing. So pretty important parameter uh, in this context. So most of the talk, uh, all uh, my focus will be on uh, individual waves. Uh, you can imagine an individual crest with the speed C. And uh, um, I'm, I'm gonna look at the, the, uh, the dissipation rate um, which is defined at the total energy dissipation during active breaking divided by some time scale, which is uh, uh, the duration of active breaking period which is on the order of the wave period. And ideally, if you have, so this is, uh, is going to be the dissipation rate per unit length of breaking crest. Okay. And, you know, in real, uh, realistic ocean, you know, uh, deep or shallow water, you have number of uh, different scales, uh, uh, different breakers uh, propagating with different speed, different directions. So if you combine this, uh, this value with um, the crest length uh, distribution of breaking waves, you can obtain the dissipation rate per unit area of the ocean surface, which will be useful for uh, typical wave models. All right. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, show some of the uh, uh, our observation in the last few slides about the, uh, the dissipation rate average over many waves and how they compare with um, the bubble plume statistics, uh, the surface signature, the white cap coverage, and also the penetration depth of uh, plumes. All right. Okay, uh, so for scaling of dissipation rate, uh, you know, uh, if you do simple dimensional analysis, you can write uh, the dissipation rate uh, like this, rho g to the minus one c to the fifth. And then uh, you're gonna get a, a free parameter b, dimensionless parameter b, which is called breaking strength parameter. And um, so you would hope you got a constant, uh, coefficient here, but uh, looking at the previous results, uh, you know, the, the B varies uh, or more than two uh, orders of magnitude. So we still need some formulation scaling and parameterization for B. So I wanna emphasize here that uh, some of the uh, variation, the reported values, uh, and variations in reported values in the literature is just because of inconsistent definition of calculating this dissipation rate. So I wanna emphasize this. In particular, uh, the, the B values that are reported for focus packets and modulated waves, uh, you, you see in a number of um, excellent publications, um, um, mainly from Melville's group, uh, for example, Drazen uh, et al. 2008 and Romero 2012. So you see a collection of uh, focus packets um, uh, from uh, with the dissipate, the B parameter 10 to the typically larger than 10 to the minus three up to 10 to the minus one. And then you have a number of cases uh, reported mainly by Banner Pearson 2007, Alice 2013, uh, Australian groups. Um, so it looks like from looking at these um, results, uh, you would, uh, you would conclude that the B values from modulated cases are significantly smaller than uh, those from focus cases, which is uh, not true, actually. Uh, I explained this in detail in uh, Drachti et al. 2018, and the main reason is just a 
inconsistent definition of the, dis, uh, the dissipation rate. In most of the previous studies, including uh, mine, uh, we typically define this dissipation rate for individual crest, right? So you track individual crest, uh, breaking crest, you calculate uh, or estimate uh, total energy dissipation and then divide by uh, some time scale in the order of active uh, breaking period. But in the, um, the data from uh, banner groups, it's actually been defined uh, as a total energy dissipation of multiple breaking events. For these modulated trains, you would get multiple breaking events. And uh, the time scale chosen was um, wave group period, which is you know order magnitude larger than the local wave period. So basically, I can conclude that here we, we're comparing apples and oranges. So um, I emphasized it in the 2018 paper, what looks like still, uh, I see this, uh, you know, these two uh, cases uh, reported together. And uh, actually I did uh, some numerical experiments for uh, the cases, uh, uh, the modulated wave cases used by Banner Group. And, uh, you know, Typically, you would get multiple breaking events. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, if you use the consistent definition uh, for the, the local uh, dissipation rate for individual crests and calculate B and compare it with the dispersive focusing cases, you would get the same range of uh, B values, which is itself, it's uh, exciting. It shows that the dynamic range of B values, the breaking strength parameter, is the same for uh, focus and modulated induced breaking cases, which is great. Uh, so, the, but uh, this is in contrast to the uh, you know previous discussions uh, about the difference between these two uh, cases. Okay, um, so still we 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 have a significant range of uh, B values. Um, so still we need formulation for B. So Drazen et al. 2018 proposed uh, an initial scaling for this dissipation rate. And what you uh, have here is basically you assume that the, the wave dissipation is uh, equal to the uh, energy dissipation, the TK dissipation rate in a cloud, a circular cloud, cylinder cloud um, with cross section A, okay, and this uh, epsilon. Uh, is just the, the average TK dissipation rate scale with the uh, velocity to the third over H. And this H is the free fall of the jet. W is the vertical velocity that you can estimate from free fall uh, assumption like this. And uh, if you do that, um, you would get your uh, energy dissipation per unit length of crest uh, is going to be proportional to this. So the only parameter in this formulation is this free fall uh, height. Okay. Uh, and then you can rewrite uh, this um, using the linear dispersion in deep water. Uh, you can convert this G to um, uh, C and K. And then uh, if you rewrite it in the, this form, um, so you can. Do you see my pointer? Sorry. So I think yes, be... we can All see right. that one. Uh, sorry. So you can you can write this in this form, and then if you assume that h over a is about one, uh, you can you can obtain uh, the, the the dissipation rate in uh, rho g to the minus one, k a five over half c to the fifth. Comparing with this form. Uh, so your B, the breaking strength parameter, scales with the wave steepness to the five half. Okay, this is great. And then uh, Mel Melvin's group did uh, lots of excellent uh, laboratory experiments, and this has been verified uh, simulations uh, with different groups. So, so what we uh, what we're doing here instead of imposing the um, we're going to use the same kind of uh, scaling argument, and uh, but uh, instead of using uh, linear dispersion in deep water, we, we write the formulation in terms of wave fruit number, GA over C squared, which in deep water, F, uh, this wave fruit number will be the wave steepness. 
But in shallow water, it's going to be at the amp wave amplitude over local depth or gamma over two. So uh, if you look at the uh, the, the formulation, uh, the, the Drazen scaling, again, so you can rewrite this in terms of wave fruit number. So now uh, this formulation is valid from deep to shallow water. And, uh, and typically the, the local depth in shallow water is uh, larger than the wave height, unless you're very close to the shoreline. So this is uh, this is uh, still valid in all water depths. So doing this, your breaking strength parameter is proportional to the wave fruit number to the five half. Okay, and still, uh, so you can write B as a you know a new parameter phi times this fruit wave fruit number, and then the question is, um, uh, can we um, have a form of parameterization for phi from deep to shallow water? So the motivation here is using the, the gamma uh, parameter proposed by Drahti et al. 2018. Um, so basically I'm looking for uh, phi as a function of gamma. And this gamma is just the rate of change of B, which is uh, a U over C at the crest uh, at uh, the threshold value 0.85 which uh, we found it's a good predictor for breaking inception. Uh, so here you see uh, an example. You see two um, uh, regular wave trains propagating over a bar from deep water shoal and propagate over a bar. So here you see um, the corresponding B values, U over C at the crest, following the crest as a function of time, okay? And, um, uh, the orange is non-breaking, is going uh, almost to the break point, but it's non-breaking. And then the black one uh, is just past the threshold value, which uh, from uh, our founding, um, it should be, it should get to the breaking onset pretty quickly, the, the B value around one. And then at uh, this, uh, when it passes the threshold value, we can calculate the rate of change of B, uh, and then we uh, we get gamma. Okay, so let's. Uh, so here you see um, how these two crests evolve. So again, black is breaking. So that when we pass the criteria, it will get to the breaking onset eventually. But uh, the orange one just gets to very close to the break point, but. Uh, Basically, it's um, non-breaking and then B decreases. Okay, so it's pretty robust uh, breaking uh, uh, onset predictor. And just for a, a quick uh, um, uh, reminder about the this B value, it's been introduced by Bothrami uh, at all 2018. So they did this, uh, they uh, look at the cases in deep and intermediate depth. And they found that this threshold value um, can segregate breaking and uh, non-breaking cases, breaking cases, uh, solid uh, symbols here. Um, uh, we did uh, a bunch of uh, uh, different numerical uh, experiments from deep to shallow water. And we found that this threshold value also holds in shallow water breaking cases. So again, with the, the same kind of threshold value. So it's very robust a breaking onset uh, predictor. So the numerical uh, experiments are uh, similar to the those reported in 2018-2020 uh, paper, the Rakhti et al. 18 and 20 paper. Uh, so the cases are covering deep to shallow water, uh, breaking uh, focus modulated wave trains uh, propagated over a flat, flat uh, bed. And also we have uh, intermediate and shallow cases uh, propagating over a submerged bar and over slow. Uh, irregular, regular, and solitary ways to consider. Okay, so again, uh, the goal here is to find phi as a function of gamma. So for each numerical case, uh, I will get a number of breaking crests. Um, so for each crest, I can track um, B at the surface, calculate gamma at the threshold value, and from post-breaking um, behavior, I can calculate uh, 
uh, the dissipation rate per unit length of crest and then get um, phi. So for each breaking crest, I have phi versus gamma, okay? And here, for example, you see the, uh, the focus waves breaking in uh, deep water from weak spilling case on the top to the strong plunging case. And you can see that with the stronger the breaker, you know, the rate of change of V is larger. So you get larger gamma. So this is the case that the modulated wave train case I showed earlier. So again, for each individual uh, crest, uh, you can you can calculate um, B and gamma and phi, right? And um, these are uh, examples for regular waves shoaling over a slope. And the cost for, for this crest, uh, the corresponding v, B uh, curve, and then these are regular waves shoaling over a bar. Okay, for all these numerical cases where we, we get the phi, um, um, and gamma. So if we plot these against uh, each other, we found a good collapse of data and maybe some saturation at large gamma values. So if, if you have very strong breaking, maybe the rate at which uh, you dissipate energy might have a cap. Uh, so, um, so these cases cover, uh, so the color here is D over L. So blue is uh, shallow water, very shallow water and uh, pink is deep water, D over L, L or larger. So this is our um, unified parameterization for the spatial rate. Uh, so uh, the B is written in terms of phi and wave fluid number, and the phi is just a function of gamma from this best fit. Um, all right, in conclusion, uh, um, we found this uh, gamma uh, can well describe um, the breaking process, the post-breaking process, and the total um, dissipation rate in all water depths. Um, if you're interested in more details, uh, uh, I think uh, I will meet uh, lots of you uh, uh, pretty soon in the, the upcoming WISE meeting. So I have a poster with more details on this. And uh, you can stop by Maria's uh, poster, um, PhD student at the University of Delaware, that he she used uh, the gamma value, this uh, parameterization framework, and uh, uh, you know uh, found very interesting result, improved breaking modeling, booziness models, which uh, one of the models that cannot represent breaking directly. Okay, uh, so I guess I have a few more minutes, so I would like to present some of the stuff. So I'll take question on that part, but uh, uh, I would like to present some of the observations uh, we, we we got from the average dissipation rate of, uh, you know, over many waves. So this time averaging is order, order of tens of minutes. And this is gonna be out soon. It's uh, in minor revision JGR. And the, the goal is uh, how these uh, two, the dissipation and the bulk plume statistics is, uh, uh, compare. So this is the um, the observation. It's um, uh, using a bunch of buoys and shipboard measurements uh, in the North Pacific Ocean. So basically, we found that the the penetrate, penetration depth of bubbles, uh, the mean penetration depth, could be larger than ten meter during the storm. These are the different colors are two estimates of the bubble plume depth as a function of um, uh, wind speed, and if you look at the the PDFs, uh, the, the 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 large values follow the Rayleigh distribution. So, you, know, you can think of uh, the maximum penetration uh, around three times the mean. And indeed, uh, we we observe uh, uh, those kind of large values. You know, for during a, a major storm. Um, during the cruise, we, we got penetration depth uh, of bubble plumes up to 30 meter, which is around uh, three times the, the mean uh, depth values. So we looked at the, the bubble plume depth, uh, uh, the scale of bubble plume depth divided by significant wave height or wind, uh, wind sea uh, significant wave height. 
um, when you plot this as a function of uh, wind speed, uh, it varies and non-monotonically. So there is no clear trend, uh, regardless of the you know the scaling you use, you know, the significant wave height or the dominant wavelength of the waves. But uh, very nicely, when you scale this bubble plume by significant wave height, it has a very nice correlation with the wave age. Um, so uh, pretty, you know, pretty much linearly, uh, there is a uh, relationship between the inverse uh, wave age. Um, we also found that this uh, bubble uh, penetration depth are well correlated with the, the white cap coverage. So the subsurface and surface uh, statistics are related. And uh, finally, um, uh, we, we found that the, the average dissipation rate or, uh, rates are very uh, well correlated with the, um, the uh, estimate for the bubble plume volume, which is the depth time, like active white cap coverage. And also because the, the white cap and uh, plume depth are related, uh, this average dissipation also related to the white cap coverage. So uh, I guess this is my last slide and happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Morteza, for the awesome talk. Let's thank the speaker here. And do we have any questions? I see Fabrice is clapping and raising his hand. Fabrice, do you want to speak? Yeah, thank you very much. Very nice talk, uh, Morteza. Um, I was wondering, <clears throat> so you're showing these um, results for the um, uh, B parameter as a function of, of different water depths. Um, I've been always thinking that one of the big differences between shallow and deep water is the fact that the waves disperse or, or doesn't do not disperse so, so much in shallow water. So how does that change with, uh, so can you specifically clarify maybe what kind of spectra you were looking at and, and how much, uh, if you were to, to look at a broad or narrow spectrum, how much dispersion might be coming into the differences between shallow and deep water, or maybe it's not relevant? Um, sure, that's a great question, actually. The, so the cases that uh, I have, I, I do have uh, monochromatic waves. Uh, sorry. And also I put uh, some irregular waves following like a typical John Swap. Um, spectrum, I did not change the, uh, you know, the, the bandwidth of the, of the incoming spectrum, but, um, so for the cases that, um, can't find, yeah, so these are the cases, uh, that I've looked at, uh, so typically here, I, I, I'm looking at the individual wave crest, right? So for individual wave crest, um, you know, looks like all all the cases, uh, uh, you know, when, when you when you use this f and uh, gamma parameter, you, you have a good collapse. So yep. maybe uh, are you talking about the the relation of the, the relationship of b versus uh, wave steepness or I'm not sure with what frame. Well, I'm trying to think of how to take that into a spectral wave model and parameterization. And that was, yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. So, so very different uh, goal, right? But okay. Yeah, we, we can, uh, we can look at that here is, uh, so everything is attached to individual crest. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, uh, and, uh, the goal is, uh, to, to use the information at the breaking, uh, inception, which you don't have in, um, wave average models, right? Sure. So this parameterization it cannot directly be used yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the, those kind of models. But you, you can, um, yeah. So this part, this phi, the phi, you, you cannot get in the like wave watch three or swan. Whatever, yeah. But uh, this b versus fruit number to the five half, um, this is applicable in in the, those that framework. Thank you. Any other questions for Morteza? So I see a question in the chat, Morteza. Can you read that or do you want me to read it out loud? 
Uh, I appreciate it. I don't see the chat. Uh, so it says, can you give a can you give a flavor as to how dissipation model is used in boost and ask model? How do you determine the spatial coverage of dissipation? Okay, uh, so um, that's a that's a great question. Uh, uh, the Ma Maria will will uh, will have lots of details on that, but typically uh, you need a breaking onset criteria, right? And uh, usually you you should define a uh, a region. Uh, you know when you detect the breaking, um, you define a region typically on the scale of one wavelength, and then you impose some eddy viscosity or surface pressure uh, over that region, uh, uh, which uh, extract energy from your model. So that's the way you. Great. Any other questions for Morteza or even uh, Debbie at this point? We have a few more minutes. Okay. If not, let's thank the speakers again, both speakers, for excellent talks. And we will see many of each other in the upcoming meeting in New Jersey. Looking forward to it. Thanks again. Bye.